scripture today. When I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost, and the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. Welcome, lady. We were hoping you would make it today. Great to see you. So our format will be worship, prayer, study, comments, and questions. So we will begin with a song, and it's quite a different one than I normally play, but it's one that's been going through my head the whole time, and it speaks of the gospel. So let's listen to the song, and here it is. Tell me, type done when you're done. Short but sweet. <laughs> great words, great song, great melody. And let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you, your gospel is power, that you have opened the doors of heaven by giving us your righteousness. There was nothing that we could do to draw ourselves to you, but you did it all. It's all of you. Salvation is all of you. It's a righteousness that is outside of us. And it is that righteousness of Christ that rescues us and calls us your own. Be glorified in your gospel this day. We ask you to open, open your word. Help us to know you better in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, our scripture it's one of my favorites for i am not ashamed of the gospel 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Good words, good words, good verse, good verse. Now we know that, and it goes without saying that the Bible is the most important book in the world. I know you would agree with me on that. Not only does it sell more copies every year than any other book, but it has also been influential than any other book in history. Even more importantly, it is the infallible, inerrant word of God by which we come to know him and to know of his salvation. It's so very clear in his word. Now, that Paul's epistle to the Roman is the most important epistle, the New Testament, it might be debated, but it is here. It is here in Paul's letter to the Romans, in this letter, more clearly than anywhere else that the uniquely Christian and biblical plan of salvation by grace through faith is laid out against all the works of men. This letter of the Romans is a treatise on God's love for his people. Just these two verses alone of chapter one are the most important in the epistle because they give the theme of the entire letter. That is the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel and that is received by faith. James Montgomery Boyce wrote that these verses are the most important in the letter and perhaps in all of literature. They are the theme of this letter and the essence of Christianity. I would tend to agree with that statement. And it was Martin Luther whom God used to ignite the reformation of the church and return Christianity to the truth of the gospel. In this process, the Lord used this same passage Struggling with his own sin in the face of a righteous God, Martin Luther found great relief in Paul's epistle to the Romans, which explained how the elect are saved by the righteousness that is credited to them. Now, this first phrase, I, I looked this up. This, it's interesting that Paul writes this, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's an interesting figure of speech, and it's a figure of speech. When I looked it up and I, I investigated, it, it is called a litotes. Let me put this here, which is an ironic understatement in which an affirmative it expressed by the negative of its contrary. Okay, an example of this would be, you won't be sorry, which means you will be saved or you will be glad. You won't be sorry. It's, it's a figure of speech. It, it's like saying, um, let's say, for example, if you say, he's not a bad athlete, you're actually saying he's a pretty good athlete. Okay. I didn't get a bad haircut, meaning I think I got a pretty good haircut. Okay. So it's kind of expressing the negative, but in expressing the negative, you're ex emphasizing the positive, if that makes sense. So when Paul says he is not ashamed of the gospel, he means I glory in the gospel. I am proud of the gospel. And we wonder why did Paul say it in this way? Well, we have to remember that Rome was the capital of a vast civilized world. A first century Roman might feel a bit uncomfortable about this Jewish man coming to their sophisticated city like Rome to preach about a Galilean carpenter who was ex executed by the Roman government in the most humiliating manner possible, and that is by being crucified. So the Romans would most likely be looking for a political or social solution to their needs, but that's, what not, that's not what Paul says here. His main message did not directly address those issues, his main message focused on the main need of every human being, whether the most religious Jew or the most educated, worldly, immoral Greek. That is, 
we need to be reconciled to a holy God. How can I be right before God? And as we've seen, Paul's theme in Romans is God and the good news that comes from him. How sinners can be rescued, as the song sang. How we can be delivered, rescued from his righteous judgment and reconciled to him. This is salvation. And in this scripture, Paul tells us that it is because the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes that we must believe it and we must proclaim it boldly, boldly. Paul is going to make three points and we're going to go quickly through these three points. The first point we will examine is the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Salvation is the main need of every person. We are all sinners. We are all in need of grace. Now, this statement here anticipates the point that Paul is going to make from this point all the way through the middle of chapter 3, where he shows that all All have sinned and thus fall under God's righteous condemnation. Because all have sinned, whether the religious Jew or the worldly Greek, we are all alienated from Christ, separated from God, who is absolutely righteous. Thus, all are under God's wrath. Paul immediately explains this. He says, for the wrath of God in the next verse, we'll cover next week, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So salvation refers, as the song pointed out, that we are being rescued from God's wrath and judgment that we deserve because of our sin. It means being delivered from the penalty of sin, which happens the moment we believe, being delivered from the power of sin as we grow in godliness, and being delivered from the very presence of sin when we stand blameless in his presence and glory. I look forward to that day when I am delivered from the very presence of sin and I stand before my Savior in glory. Won't that be a wonderful day? But if you think that we need to sell this gospel by glossing over the negative aspects of salvation and focusing on only on the positive side of it, then we fall into the sin of being ashamed of the gospel. We do not need God's salvation and Christ did not need to die on the cross if we are all basically good people who just need a little encouragement to be right with God. We do not need a crucified Savior if our main need is to polish our self-esteem and learn some helpful hints for happy living. We need Jesus. We need a Savior who was crucified for our sins because we all by nature are ungodly rebels who are under God's righteous wrath. This is the offensive. This is offensive to the natural man. But if we neglect it, if we put aside this point, we miss the very heart of the gospel. The gospel is only good news to the person who realizes that he needs to be saved or he will be eternally perished. So salvation requires the power of God. It is salvation that is, it is the gospel that is the power for salvation. So the gospel does not tell people about the power of God. Rather, Paul says here, it is, it is the power of God. Did you notice the difference? The gospel is the power of God for salvation. This means that salvation is not something that sinners can attain by their own efforts or their own good works. If that were so, Christ did not need to die on the cross. Salvation is not a joint project where God has done his part and now you must contribute your part. Salvation 
is received and it is sustained by faith alone from start to finish. But saving faith, which includes repentance, is not something that sinners can produce on their own. Saving faith is the gift of God so that we will never, ever be able to boast. It is power. The gospel is power. We need to see that truth. It is crucial to see that salvation does not depend on human decision, but on the very power of God. It requires that God impart new life to a dead sinner, something that is impossible for men to bring about. It was the power of God through the word of Jesus imparted life to Lazarus when he was raised from the dead. The gospel is just like that. Lazarus couldn't raise himself. He was in the grave. He was dead. He was beginning to rot. But it was the power of God that raised him. Salvation is from the Lord. It requires the very power of God. The gospel is not helpful advice that a person may decide to try out. I remember some years ago, a ridiculous bumper sticker came out. People were putting them on their cars and it says, try Jesus. I'm sorry, we don't try Jesus. Jesus gives us power. He gives us faith to believe. It's not something we put on to try like we're trying a new pair of shoes. The gospel is power. It's from the Lord. The preaching of the word does not make, merely make salvation possible, but it effects salvation to those who are called. So the preaching of the word is important because it makes salvation possible for those who have been called. So salvation demands, according to this verse, that the righteousness of God be upheld and applied to the guilty sinner. In verse 17, Paul explains why the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It says, he says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Notice that the gospel is revealed to us by God through his son. It comes to us by revelation that from God that focuses, that centers in his son. Paul does not lead off with the love of God in the gospel, but rather with the righteousness of God. Certainly the gospel displays God love, God's love for sinners. If God is loving, but he is not righteous, then it's easy to view him as our good buddy in the sky. But the righteousness of God represents a problem because we all know that we have sinned. If God is righteous and we are not, then we need a savior. We need the gospel. We need the righteousness of God. And that is what is revealed in this gospel. The righteousness of God that Paul refers to is the righteousness that comes from God, which he gives to those who believe. F. F. Bruce, on his commentary on Romans, argues that in the Old Testament, which forms the main background of Paul's thought and language, righteousness is not so much a moral quality as rather a legal declaration. Let me put this quote here. God himself is righteous, and those men and women are righteous who are in the right in relationship to God and his law. When therefore the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, it is revealed in a twofold manner. The gospel tells us first how men and women, sinners as they are, can come to be in the right with God. And second, how God's personal righteousness is vindicated in the very act of declaring sinful men and women righteous. Let me make a, a separation here. We are not made righteous. 
we are declared righteous in the sight of God. It is a forensic righteousness. It is a righteousness that is outside of us because it belongs to Jesus Christ. And I love that quote. Thank you for psalmist. I do not come into this pulpit hoping that perhaps someone will of his own free will return to Christ. My hope lies in another quarter. I hope that my master will lay hold of some of them and say, you are mine and you shall be mine. I claim you for myself. My hope arises from the freeness of grace and not from the freedom of will. As a matter of fact, <laughs> in many ways, we need to be delivered from our will, don't we? So the gospel reveals how sinners may be declared righteous or justified before God by faith. We know that this is his meaning by comparing Romans 1.17 and when we look at, at Romans 3, let me put it up here on the screen for you. Paul writes a little later in Romans, he says, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, if, if God just glosses over our sin, then God is not just. But God is both the just, he remains loving and just, and he justifies us at the same time. What an amazing Savior. God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel in that he can grant right standing to sinners because his son met the righteous requirement of his perfect law and died to pay the penalty that sinners deserve. Sinners are never justified by their own righteousness by keeping the law, but rather by God imputing that righteousness of Christ to them by faith. So salvation upholds God's righteousness by applying it to the sinner who believes. And salvation is by faith from start to finish. Paul mentions believing or faith four times in these two verses. He says, to everyone who believes, or from faith to faith, the righteous shall live by faith. If salvation comes through faith plus good works, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches and all of the cults teach, then it's not good news because you could never know whether you have piled up enough good works to qualify. But if God declares guilty sinners to be righteous or justified the instant they believe, that is good news. Amen? But we need to be clear on several things here. First, saving faith in Christ is not a general belief that he is Savior. The demons believe that but they are not saved. Rather, saving faith has three elements. First, with the mind, we must understand the content of the gospel, who Jesus is, what his death on the cross means, and that he was raised from the dead. Second, we must have a heart response to the truth of the gospel, where we agree that it is true and that our agreement causes our hearts to be sorrowful about our sin and also to rejoice in the free offer of God's grace. But finally, third, saving faith includes commitment to Jesus Christ, where we trust in him and his death on the cross as our only hope of eternal life. And we follow him as Lord 
Saving faith is not a work that we do, but rather simply receiving all that God offers us in Jesus Christ. It is the hand that receives the free gift of God. Paul here puts an interesting phrase in verse 17. He uses the phrase from faith to faith. Paul is emphasizing the centrality of faith in receiving the benefits of the gospel. The NIV translates this phrase, by faith from first to last. We receive the gospel by faith and we go on living by faith. Saving faith is not a single event, but rather an ongoing, lifelong process. We are justified the instant we believe. But as we go on believing the gospel, God keeps revealing to us that the fact that we have the right standing before him on the basis of Christ's substitutionary death on the cross. Faith applies the imputed righteousness of Christ to us so that we increasingly rejoice in Christ alone as our only hope of eternal life. We never come to a place where we can trust in our good works as sufficient for or even contributing in any way to our salvation. The only thing that we contribute to our salvation is the sin that made it possible. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that was Spurgeon that said that. I may be wrong. Then Paul uses a quote from Habakkuk 2, verse 4. The righteous shall live by faith. He uses it to partly show that his gospel is not a new idea. It's not something that Paul thought up. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk confirms the truth that righteousness can only be attained on a basis of faith. But notice you said you see here, he says, to the Jew first. Paul means that the gospel came first in history to the Jews. God chose Abraham and his descendants through Isaac and Jacob as the race to which he revealed his salvation. It was through the Jews that the Savior came. But here Paul's emphasis is on the universal free offer of the gospel. It is for everyone who will believe. It is for the religious Jew who will believe. It is for the pagan Greek who will believe. No one need be excluded. The good news is for you, whatever your background. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Thank you, Jonathan Edwards. Well, I was wrong. Thank you for finding that psalmist. Second point, because the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, we must believe it, of course. Believing and trusting goes hand in hand. To believe is to, to trust. To trust is to believe. And there's an old song that goes, trust and obey. So I would add to believe is to trust, to trust is to believe, to believe is to obey. This is not a one-time decision that we make for Christ when we walk an aisle and repeat a prayer. This is a lifelong process of resting and trusting God to complete the work that he has began. It is all of grace. God will be glorified in the final analysis for all of his elect when we stand face to face with our Savior. Salvation has a past, a present, and a future aspect to it. And third and last point. Because the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, we must proclaim it boldly. You have been set apart for a purpose. You have been elected. You have been called by God for a specific purpose. Our entire life has been set apart for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God in all that we do and all that we say. The gospel we proclaim is alive. It gives life. To proclaim the gospel, we must exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We must confront sinners with their guilt and the danger of judgment and offer God's grace to those who repent. So whenever, whenever you get an opportunity to talk to someone about spiritual matters, seek to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. The sinner needs to know who Jesus is and what he did. God's grace is amazing and the gospel is power, but unless they hear, they will not know the power of God through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Let us be bold. Let us show for the power of the glorious gospel. I'll give you three short conclusions. First conclusion, the gospel is the good news that God has revealed to us how we can be rescued from the wrath to come. It is a very power of God to save everyone who believes because in it, God reveals how his perfect righteousness will be put to the account of the guilty sinner who trusts in God. Second, in these verses, and this, these are two good verses to memorize. I would encourage you this week to pour over these verses and let them speak into your heart and to mine and that you would memorize them. In these two verses, Paul has given us a summary of the theme of this letter that he is writing and to the Church of Rome. The rest of the book is going to be an unfolding of this theme and a fuller explanation of this theme that righteousness comes from God, that God in mercy justifies guilty, condemned sinners by grace alone through faith in Christ alone. Beginning next week, we are going to begin to look at the bad news of the gospel, that we are all guilty, condemned sinners deserving God's wrathful judgment. We have to learn the bad news before we get to the good news. And third point, third conclusion, the gospel is not only the truth by which we are saved and that truth by which others are saved as we bear witness, it is also the truth which is the standard of our daily lives. Paul said to the Colossians, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. We must preach the gospel to ourselves. We must remind ourselves of the goodness of the Lord in saving wretched sinners, that he is ours and he is our God and we are his people. Walk as people of the Lord. And that is what the gospel teaches us to do. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad Lady showed up because I promised her a song that I would play today. And I will put post the words here for you to sing along. And I will close us in prayer when we are done.
Amen. And it is well with our souls because of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the gospel of Christ that has rescued us out of darkness, has brought us into your marvelous light, that we are now your people called forth for your glory. We thank you for the glorious gospel because it is the power of God. Just in those words, we thank you, Father. We glorify your name. We give you glory. Help us to reflect that glory day by day that others may see Christ in us and we can share that gospel with them. Be glorified in us this day. We thank you for this these words, we thank you for your scripture that we have read today. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. It's always my pleasure, and I will see you again next week. God bless.